Kratha smarami hridi sang sfuradat matatvang Satchit sukhang paramahang sagatim turiyang Yat svap na jaga rasushuktam aveti nityang Tat brahmanishkala maham na chabhuta sangha In the early hours of the day, I meditate upon the Atman, the essential self clearly experienceable in the heart space, that which is existence, knowledge, bliss in nature, that which is the Paramahamsa state, the supreme goal, that which is the fourth state of consciousness, Turiya, that constantly illuminates all experiences in the waking, dream, and deep sleep states. I am that partless, unchanging Brahman, not this aggregate of material envelopments. Namaste. I'm very happy to bring you a new series. Now, I know I said I wasn't going to do another series. <laughs> I had felt that I kind of painted myself into a corner because really my only interest these days is in the Upanishadic wisdom of Advaita, Brahman, Atman. And the Upanishads plainly state that they are not to be read or heard by anyone except sannyasis. So, okay, I'm a sannyasi, so that's okay. But as far as presenting it publicly, it's definitely not okay. So I even removed all my Upanishad videos from the public YouTube and put them unlisted. So if any of those or any of you are sannyasis, get in touch <laughs> and I can give you links. But I felt a lack because, first of all, the Upanishads themselves are very difficult. They're extremely esoteric. They're meant for erudite scholars. Really, the qualification, the intellectual qualification for the Upanishads is one who has completed the study of the Vedas. That means memorize and be able to recite and also perform the Vedic sacrifices. That's a tall order these days. Very, very few people are in that level. So what to do? Uh, because the world is more in need of these teachings than ever. So I was going through my files, doing some research, and I found that Shankaracharya, Sripad Shankaracharya, the greatest teacher of Advaita, has also written some entry-level materials, which, although they contain Upanishadic wisdom, are not Upanishads. And so there is no scriptural prohibition against sharing them publicly. That's where this series comes from. My desire to help people, which I was feeling very frustrated around the holidays because I realized that I couldn't anymore present direct Upanishads, but Atma Bodha, and there are several similar works, which we can get to in future, is perfect for beginners. It's perfect for people in household life who are preparing for renunciation, who are uh, just beginning to practice austerities and so on. So we're going to go through this 84 or 86 verses depending on the recension, and go through uh, Shankara's commentaries on it, or at least the synonyms, Sanskrit synonyms, 
and explain the meanings, explain the definitions of everything. So speaking of definitions, it's always good to define terms before we start using them in a teaching. So we're going to define Atma Bodha. First of all, the definition of Atma. Atman is derived from An, to breathe, from At, to move, and from Va, to blow, because Atman is the life breath, and when Atman is present, then the body is alive, and when Atman leaves, it falls down dead. So next definition is the highest principle of life, Brahman or Paramatman, that is the absolute source of being, consciousness, and bliss, which is resident in the heart of every living creature as Paramatman, Antaryami. There's another definition, the soul, the principle of life and consciousness. That's pretty self-evident. And it can also mean essence, nature, character, or peculiarity. Every individual being has consciousness. Wherever there's life, there's consciousness. And wherever there's consciousness, there's Atman. Atman is the supreme, the absolute, Brahman. There is no other explanation for consciousness. In fact, it's absolutely impossible that consciousness could come from matter. The scientists want to say that there's some neurological function that develops consciousness, but that's not so. The reason it's not so is that even in deep sleep, when one is unaware of the body and senses, Consciousness is there. It doesn't have any objects, but in the morning we remember, oh, I slept very well. That was refreshing sleep. So that's because we are aware of being unaware of anything in Sushupti. That's another conversation. <laughs> Let's go on to define Bodha. Bodha means knowing understanding, waking, becoming or being awake, consciousness, perception, apprehension, thought, knowledge, understanding, intelligence, making known, informing, instructing. So finally, Atma Bodha means possession of knowledge of the self, the Supreme Spirit, it's also one of the Upanishads of the Rig Veda, but we're not going to go into that here. And finally, of course, it's the name of a work of Shankaracharya, the present work, Atma Bodha. So you see, as with all Sanskrit words, there are multiple definitions. And the definitions that we are going to use are those that are appropriate in the context and what is that? Instruction leading to awakening and understanding of the Supreme Spirit, consciousness, the source of everything. And this will be reiterated and emphasized and repeated again and again in the text, which is what is necessary for learning. I was just reading in the Chandogya Upanishad, about one Vedic scholar, this boy, young boy, who just came back from 12 years of deep, intensive Vedic study, during which he memorized all the four Vedas and learned how to perform all the ceremonies and so on and so forth. And he comes back to his father all puffed up. <laughs> His name is Shveta Ketu. Shveta Ketu was very proud of his knowledge. He had learned all about action and its results, karma. But the father said to him, well, now that you're so smart, <laughs> why 
Do you know that knowledge by which everything is known? And he had to say, well, no, I had never heard of such a thing. And uh, he said, well, if you haven't heard of it, that's because your teachers didn't know it. They're honest men. If they knew, they would tell you. So then the boy says, well, Father, do you know? If you know, please teach me. So the father begins to teach. And when he gets to the, the punchline, as it were, Tatvamasi, thou art that. You are also Brahman. The boy says, I don't get it. <laughs> Here he is. He has all this academic knowledge, all this knowledge of Vedic ceremonies, actions, and what to do in this and that circumstance and so forth. But he can't understand that he is Brahman. So the father has to repeat the teaching at least 14 times. I lost count at 14 <laughs> before the boy finally gets it. So even for one with outstanding qualifications, deep background in Vedic knowledge, this knowledge is hard to get, hard to understand, difficult to comprehend. Therefore, repetition is necessary. That's all right. It doesn't mean that we think you're stupid. We know you're not stupid or you wouldn't be watching this. But it takes that repetition over a significant length of time to overcome the conditioning of the mind and become convinced, absolutely rock-solid convinced, that aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman. I am nothing but Brahman. Pure consciousness, being, bliss. So this is the message. It's very simple, in essence. But it's difficult to comprehend because we've heard so many stories against it. So we have to overcome our conditioning. We have to retrain our minds. And this is accomplished through repetition, spaced repetition is the technical term for it. And so this series is going to be going on for some time, uh, every other day or every three days or so. And so in the meantime, you can listen to the previous verses over and over again and convince yourself that this teaching is the absolute truth. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya.